Life Stories Live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for another Life Story coming to you from Life Stories Worldwide. If you need prayer, you need help, then contact us on our hotline, plus 44-794-355-0287. Or go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. You'll find lots of help and encouragement there. Welcome to all our listeners in Ukraine, especially, and those from Torch Trust who are listening, and all around the world. We welcome you to this wonderful story going out on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube live. Tonight, we're going to Brazil. Our guest speaker tonight is Alex Ribeiro. He was um, a Formula One racing driver in the 70s, a main Brazilian racing driver. And out of his um, workshop, people like, um, trying to find out, Nelson Piquet and Roberto Moreno, they, their talents came from that workshop in Brasilia. But off the track, uh, Alex has done many things. He's a, a businessman, a radio announcer, a sports commentator, motivational speaker, mentor and chaplain. And he has had an influence on athletes in many sports. And Alex has a wonderful story that he's going to share with you tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Alex now in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Thanks, Alex. It's a pleasure for me to be together with you in this program. And we am very glad to remember my days from England and motor racing and, and all sorts of things that the Lord has done through this life of his life in my life. All right. So my story, my story uh, started um, when I was born uh, into a family, a Christian family in back in 1948. My father was a medical doctor with a, a missionary heart. So he decided to go to, to the inner part of the, of the country which was well, not very well developed at that time. So he, he, he was a doctor where doctors were, were most needed. And, and he founded churches and he helped a lot, a lot of people. When Brazil decided to, to build up an, a new capital, um, in, in, it, 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 the, the place they choose to build the capital was near, <clears throat> was, was, uh, how can I say, near, near where we were living. So my father decided to move to Brazil and he was the first doctor to be, to, to, to come to, to Brazil. And um, when we arrived there, there was nothing, nothing. We see just uh, that city grow, uh, grow up from, from, from nothing to, to a town. So we arrived there in 50, 57. And in, the, in, in April 1960, there was this big party because the capital was ready to be to, and, and running. So that they built the whole city in, in four years, three or four years. And um, to celebrate the inauguration of the capital, there is this big race uh, because Brazilian was born to 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 to, to drive. The, the the streets are not squared, and, and it's very much like a layout of race of a racing circuit. And I was absolutely fascinated by the race when I watched the race, and I was I was in love with that. I said, "Wow!" When I grew up. I'm going to be a racing driver. And I was only 11 at that time. And so I started to work and to get the knowledge, what it takes to be a racing driver. And I took it so serious that my Bible was the popular mechanics, the auto sport. And I used to read it and I used to, 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 to read everything and to go to workshops and ask thousands of questions to the mechanics until they, they get fed up with me. It's a 
get out of here, boy. <laughs> go, go, go away. We have much more things to do than answer your questions. But as I grew up uh, in knowledge, um, seven years later, because in Brazil, we, at that time, you couldn't, couldn't race before you were 18 and have your regular driver's license. So I had to wait for seven years to put my hands in a, in, in a car, in a wheel to, to drive. But I've been practicing without being, uh, having the, the driver's license. And, uh, but when I was in, in January, 67, uh, I went to the car show in Sao Paulo and I speak to many people there and I make contacts and I, I, I really knew what it takes to be a racing driver. And uh, the knowledge told me that my dream was an impossible dream because motor racing is very expensive. You need a car to start with. <laughs> I didn't have a car. And if I have a car, if I had a car at that time, I didn't have money to put petrol in it. Uh, so logically, there is no way to be a racing driver. But knowing God, uh, I propose a covenant to God. And I told God, if you turn my dream into reality, I promised you there will be a proclaimer of the gospel for the rest of my life, wherever you send me, I will go. And God answered my prayers very, very quickly and, and efficiently. In three months, he <clears throat> organized a series of factors that allowed myself and three other, other guys, Paus, uh, we, we were racing in France since when we were younger. And um, we, we used to race slot cars together. And, and the, the four of us, we decided to put up a working shop so we could tune up the cars and, and be very fast on the, on the streets of, of which would look like a racing track, the streets of Brasilia. So we used to practice illegal racing at night. <laughs> and, and, um... He's coming. Jesus is coming. I can't wait to hear the trumpet call He's coming Jesus is coming And when he comes we'll crown him Lord of all And when he comes we'll crown him Lord of all I Stories Live but we didn't have the cars. I, I used my father, my mother's cars. The other used uh, his father's car. So we we were for potential drivers with no cars and budget zero. With zero budget, we start this workshop in the backyard of the house of the mother of of Stika, one of them, one of the four, and Eladio's um, father own a workshop which we didn't uh, didn't work was out of business and so he lent us the the, the tools and we start um, doing service servicing cars of of our friends the friends of our fathers our prof teachers at the university and uh, but we want a car so i prayed for a car and the Lord answered the, 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 my prayer in the most bizarre way. My father had a big crush with his Volkswagen Beetle uh, and was in hospital. The first week, we didn't know if he would survive or not. Uh, but eventually, when he was able to talk, I went there and asked him for the wreckage of the VW Beetle. And, uh, and he was unsure, well, what are you going to do with that? I said, well, I'll try to fix it. But uh, the, the 
insurance company <clears throat> said it was a total loss. There was no way to rebuild that. So I end up with the records of the VW <laughs> and together with the three of my three powers, we stripped the bodywork off. Uh, we managed to, to fix the chassis. And one day we went to a, to a we, we just have a chassis with a seat, a seat belt not to be throwing out of it. And it, and it was, we went to test it. And it was very quick. So we figured out that uh, if we put inside that chassis just the sufficient things to go through the scrutineering, technical scrutineering, we would be very fast. Because not because we have a lot of, of power, but it, it will be the lightest car in, in, the, in the race. So we built it out of uh, the wreckage. Say, uh, um, the, when they threw the parts in the, in the junk, junkyard uh, of the workshops, uh, and replaced by new ones we, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the junk parts, we, we put it together. And we built the most strange thing in, on top of it to, to, to have no project. And then we went to race in four weeks. So this was the final result. So this was the car with you. And uh, they call it the ugly duckling. Because when we appeared on a race circuit with that thing, the, the crowd went berserk. <laughs> they, they laughed a lot, and the start the races there was no practice. The place, places on the grid was defined by draw, and when my time to my number on the grid was the last thirtieth <laughs> in the grid, and I remember the verse of the Bible that says the the late ones will be the first. I said, "Well, let's let's go in." I think it's happened. It's going to happen here. I was hopeful, and but uh, the car was a joke. Uh, after six hours of racing, it was a uh, five hundred kilometers, but it, it, on the streets, the high average speed was not very high. And after six hours, we finished second. And the race was a very important race, part of the Brazilian championship. And um, we got all the media, uh, TV, radio, riot. And we went from zero to, to 100 <laughs> miles in, in one weekend. Um, so we, we turned up to be a business. Uh, and our workshop was... Um, was a point, meeting point for the, the guys who had blood in their veins. Uh, and uh, we, we, for, we, we grew up from that to be a, a, a respectable speed race, uh, speed, uh, speed shop. And uh, from there, the, that uh, backyard workshop produced three, 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 three Brazilian drivers to Formula One, myself, Moreno, and, and Pique, the three times world champion. So God, God is good. When he blesses it, he, he do it in, in style. And, but one thing that made the big difference um, was the fact that God, although all of this, it, it was a miracle. It couldn't be, it could it's inconceivable, <laughs> normally speaking, that guys, the four young guys, I was the oldest uh, with 18, the youngest was Elijah with 16, and to build, to, and to go such far, far away, humanly speaking, it, the, the, whole, the whole operation was a, um, a miracle. And I was so grateful to God that I put a small sticker on the car, Jesus is the only hope. Uh, and I put it on a, mini, a small <clears throat> uh, windscreen. And uh, it was very little, the, the sticker, just for God to look from above with his magnifier. <laughs> 
and I would say, thanks God, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm wonderfully thank, uh, um, full of gratitude and praise in my heart for making come true, my dream come true. And from there, we evolved. We when I well, when I when I grew up in, from the ugly darkly to. He's coming. Jesus is coming. Formula Ford. When Formula Ford came to Brazil. And I was, uh, the first year was not very good. The second, I was second in the championship. The third year, I was the champion. And not only that, I was the number one in the ranking of the Brazilians, uh, drivers, racing drivers. With, with, that, with, um, with that, we got the money, the sponsorship to come to England. But one fact happened there, which opened my eyes um, to, to what was, was happening. For me, I just went to race for pleasure, for my pleasure. But when I, I became champion and the journalists were journalists of the main newspaper of the country, came to me and asked, Alex, uh, the, my chief wants to, me to interview you. Why Jesus saves on your car? Why? those youngsters that come with the Jesus Saves t-shirts and, and come to the racing. And why do they, when you get to the podium, they sing a song, Jesus Saves, always saves, and, and people get silent uh, to hear them. And why they put burners, why they give tracks on the speed, uh, on, on the grandstands, uh, why? Jesus saves. And then he said, told me, I don't know how, to, I don't know anything about religion. Could you write the text for me? I said, wow, okay. So together with Pastor Aeneas Tonini, my mentor, uh, we put together a piece of piece, uh, uh, um, explaining why and why and how, why. Yeah, why? Jesus says because people then we present the plan of salvation and the four spiritual laws and for our punishment that was published in, in a quarter of a page of the Sunday issue of the newspaper. And I realized that I had uh, preached the gospel to 400,000 readers of that paper, uh, speaking from a pulpit that moved at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> And, and I realized uh, that I have a mission on it, and that, that was to proclaim the world to, to, to everybody. So that came like a vision. We believe that we can reach the world for Christ through the universal language of sports. And that was very important for me from that moment on. Immediately in the year after being the number one of the ranking, uh, I moved to England in 1974 to drive Formula 3. And I, I finished second in the Formula 3 championship. Um, following year, I did another season in Formula 3 with March. I was second again, vice champion. And 76, I graduated to Formula 2. And although I didn't win races, I was always a front runner driving for the March BMW uh, official team. And um, at the end of that year, BMW gave me a trophy for the best BMW driver in Formula 2 at that stage. And, and I, I made my debut in Formula 1 at the, at the USA Grand Prix at the end of the season with a Heskett. And, um, and that's allow me to do a full season in the, the, in the next year, which was 77. Then I did a full season in Formula One, and it was a disaster. <laughs> oh, I built in 10 years. Uh, I lost in one year because 
the car was so bad and the team was so badly uh, managed and uh, and that was the beginning of the end of my career. The following year, I didn't have sponsors, so I put some of the money, most of the money I earned in 10 years into a private team, uh, which we called the Jesus Saves Racing Team. And it was uh, myself, Alastair McQueen, who is a brother in Christ, and Alan Docking and Wayne DePain, the mechanic, the four of us, we we run a team with uh, no big budget, just enough to to go from race to race by faith. Um, but my prayer prayer group in 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 England, we have a very strong backup from Reverend Colin G and his wife, which adopt myself and Barbara as their sons. Uh, and mother uh, spiritually. So we were discipled by them and we grew up spiritually tremendously and they fast and pray. And we won a race in Nürburgring, which was a typical race of David against Goliath. <laughs> uh, it was the race of my life. And uh, after that, we had no more money, I had to pack up and come back to Brazil. And I was very frustrated when I had to finish motor racing, got depressed, uh, was mad about God because he allowed me to come down and be a, uh, a pedestrian instead of a driver. <laughs> and uh, after some years of uh, in the desert, he move his, his uh, in this articulate this situation. I became a, a farmer, uh, entrepreneur in, in, during my years of desert. And I did all sorts of things <clears throat> until one day God uh, brought me back and took me out of the of my bad mood and, and changed my life, gave me another race to race. And I became a missionary, a full-time missionary of a mission called Atletas de Cristo. And, uh, and he, with Atletas de Cristo was my, uh, my, my, the best years of my life, where I was the right man at the right place. Uh, for the job, for the task. And he blessed us so richly. So I started working with uh, high profile athletes in football and I discipled some of them. They went, they were picked up for the Brazilian national team. And uh, they invite me to follow them and to give them spiritual help and, and psychological uh, um, teachings and to, to put in practice what I learned from the pressures of being in a top sport performance for former and the ups and downs, how sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, uh, the emotional uh, life of a, of a um, high profile athlete, it's like a WWW all the time, <laughs> how to handle pressure, how to handle fear, how to handle fear of getting hurt, uh, of, of, of losing a uh, goal in front of the crowd and be booed by thousands and, and how to deal with the sex offers and so how to handle the press, how to handle so, so many things that might happen to high profile athletes because people look from outside, think that they, they have no problems. Yes, we all have problems and the higher is the, the, the higher you go, the higher is the responsibility and um, I could help them a lot and they invite me to go 
with them to the, their battlefields of a world championship and followed, I followed them for seven, seven World Cups in football. I went to five Olympic Games. He's coming. Jesus is coming. I can't wait to hear the trumpet call. He's coming. Jesus is coming. And when he comes, we'll crown him Lord of all. Life Stories